So good to see each and every one of you here today. For those of you joining us online, we pray God's best for you. We're excited about going through this incredible book of Titus. And before we get into this, I just want to give a little bit of a uh, history or just kind of what's the general view. And I want to ask a question, I want a little bit of feedback. When we think about this, this book in, in Scripture in the New Testament, what's the, the main purpose of the book of Titus? What, what, what's he, the, the author, what is Paul getting at? Or the Holy Spirit through him with, and what does he have for the church? So does it, can anybody give me just a real quick summary statement? God's written music, God's word. Okay, preach God's word. Raise up good leaders. Up good leaders. Okay, anybody else? What was the question? What's the main point? What's the, what they're trying to get across in this book of Titus? So we just saw a little caption of it. But if we could summarize what, what, what Paul is getting at through this and what he's addressing is he's equating godliness with truth. The more God's word has a hold of our lives, the more the Holy Spirit is pervading in our everyday living, the natural result, the, the unmitigated result is going to be godliness. And so if there's not godliness in the church, there's something wrong with the process of his truth working its way into the hearts of his people. And so he's talking about we need good leadership to make sure that people get good truth, that good truth influences people's lives in such a way that it produces godly living. That's the book of Titus. That's what we're working at. So that's what we're going to work through today. So with that, just a little summary kind of going in so we understand the bedrock of what we're learning and what's the foundation of our text today. And I'm going to be, excuse me, for those of you on camera, I'm going to grab my, grab my glasses. I'm over 50 now, so I need these things. All right. And as we do, I just want to, we have a couple of people here from Texas that, that are part of our work there, Michael and Annie, and, and those moving to Chicago, Ros Rosio and Alberto, God bless you guys, and so many others, Don, Tom, Andrew, Amy, God bless you guys. So good to see everybody here. All right. With that, uh, we'll, we'll catch up later, I guarantee so let's, let's look, take a look again, and we're going to look at Titus. Uh, Titus was a young man that, that Paul was writing to, and I want us to understand who he was. He was a Greek Gentile who had most likely given his heart to the Lord through Paul's missionary efforts over the past 20, 30 years, and he was so impacted by the gospel, the gospel that we're going to look at more closely today, that he left everything he had to join Paul in his efforts to grow fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ around the world. He, he gave it up, all of it, to, in service to the Lord. And so Paul was established in him at, in a place of leadership on the island of Crete. Well, where was Crete? It's a Greek island where the church began from Jewish travelers at Pentecost. If you remember, there were some that came from Crete who saw the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. They were praising God in other tongues. One of the tongues was the, 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 the language that was spoken on, on Crete. And so they came and they took the gospel back with them to this Greek island. And it was an immature church that struggled with the challenges of being more worldly than godly. So they, they'd seen the effects, the majesty of God's work in his people. They took it back to Crete, but they were in involving the world with their idea of Christianity and the gospel. And what came out was this compromised church. In fact, what is the church known for today? Or what, what do people, the, the main accusation, it's full of godly people. Hypocrisy, come on, guys. <laughs> right? So it's full of hypocrisy. The very thing Paul is addressing in our text. And hypocrisy's not struggling with doing the right thing. Hypocrisy's faking it. It's putting on a mask. I don't really believe what this is teaching, so I'm just going to kind of engraft some of the things I want into my life and still be in charge. I'm in charge instead of the Lord being in charge. That's not Christianity. And that's what Paul is addressing in our passage. And so in order to tackle this daunting task Paul assigns Timothy or Crete or uh, Titus excuse me with developing leaders who would withstand this lean towards corruption to be watchmen on the walls we've already seen that remember they are those of the circumcision that were uh, upsetting entire households and Paul says that breaks my heart men you've got to be watchmen on the walls watch what's taking place in your home make sure that your children your family 
understands what it means to know Jesus Christ personally and walk with him and serve him with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind and set an example of developing leaders worth following. So let me give us a little bit of a background to where we're at right now just so, so we understand. We started with Paul's salutation, verses 1 to 4. And in this, we have Paul's example of leadership, to lead with purpose. We learned that Paul, the name literally was changed from Saul. Saul was the best in the world's eyes. Paul literally means little one. And if we're going to be an example of godly leadership, we need to stay humble. We need to be productive. We need to disseminate truth. And allow people to understand it in a way and apply it in a way that transformed their lives. Be productive and stay focused that each of us are God's ambassadors in this world. I believe Paul's challenge to every believer is to live a life that reflects the lordship of Jesus Christ in such a way that impacts the world around us, drawn into him. We may be the only Bible some people ever take the time to read. And may they get a good glimpse of Jesus by what they see in us. Secondly, we looked at Paul's instruction, verses 5 to 9, and that was putting the right people in the right places at the right time with the right character. Lead with effect, effectively passing on what's most important. What's the mark of a good leader? Somebody who takes what's important to them and makes sure that's what's important to those that are following. Thirdly, we saw Paul's reason for this, because evil prevails when good men do nothing. We see the effects of evil in our world today like no other time. Paul says, lead with courage. Confront the influence of evil in the world. Confront the the influence of evil in our culture. Confront the uh, influence of evil in our homes. Confront the influence of evil in our lives. Then we looked at Paul's plea in verses 1 to 10, and we're reminded that our our walk talks and our talk talks, but our walk talks louder than our talk talks, right? That's what he gets at in verses uh, 1 to 10 of chapter 2. He says, lead by example, demonstrate godliness, and we learn. We set the high mark up here, but we can never achieve this mark in our own strength. It's the result of the gospel. And so he goes right into the the gospel. Paul's confidence, verses 11 to 15. The gospel works. It transformed lives. Believe it. Live it. Share it. Trust it. Don't add to it. Don't take away from it. It is what it is. The very word of God that transforms the lives of those who believe and receive. Amen? It's the gospel entrusted to us that is able to save our souls. So lead with grace. Lean heavily on and trust God's grace. And now we have Paul's reminder, lead with character. In terms of leadership and magnifying the impact of our influence for the glory of God and the advancement of the gospel, Titus 3 reminds us of three very important truths that we're going to consider this morning. One is, our lifestyle is our testimony, and our testimony matters. Amen? Well, we'll double down on that in a few minutes here. Number two, The challenge is clear. Bear Christ's winsomeness to those in opposition to him. Right? We are a city set on a hill. Let your light so shine before men. Men who are in darkness. Thirdly, the gospel is our hope. It's the only power available to meet God's demands and God's desires. So with that in mind, let's look at Titus chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. And as we do, let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to sit at your feet. We're here today, uh, removed from our busy schedules. And I pray through the hustle and bustle of life that we would be still and know that you are God. I thank thank you for the privilege and and the opportunity to come and just say thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you're done. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for what's going to be accomplished according to your great plan as the sovereign Lord. That we can rest in peace, peace and an assurance that you're on the throne and that you cause all things to work out to the good of those who love you and are called according to your purpose. So now, Lord, give us ears to hear what the Spirit says to your church through your word. Lord, that we would see it as a treasure full of of golden nuggets that are uh, worth more than anything this world has to offer. 
and that we would latch on to it. More importantly, that the truth would latch on to us and as a result conform us into the people that you've destined us to be through Jesus Christ our Lord. God, grant this, we ask in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. Titus 3, 1 to 8, and I'll do my best to stick with my notes because I want to be considerate of our time and make sure we end appropriately. He says, remind them, who's them? Remind the leaders, uh, the listeners, those in this, this struggling church that are longing to be and fulfill what God's called them to be and do. Remind them to be subject to rulers, to authorities, those that are in charge, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed. Convicting for anybody yet? <laughs> okay, just me. All right. <laughs> to, to slander no one. Uh, not to be contentious, but to be gentle, showing every consideration for all people or showing humility to all people. For we too were once foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, spending our life in malice and envy. What Paul is doing here is giving us a description of the world outside of Christ. Okay, it's a description of our culture. Spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. Why is all this in our world? Because people are deceived. They've bought a lie. And we see the effects of those lies. But here's the answer. Here's the remedy and the only remedy for the problems in our world. When the kindness of, our, of God, our Savior, and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Hallelujah. Not on the basis of deeds, not because we earned it or deserved it, which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with his mercy, God has given us what we don't deserve in the sacrificial work of Jesus Christ, hallelujah, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. By the washing of regeneration, we are born again and the renewing, this, this sanctification, this ongoing process of being more like Jesus by the work of the Holy Spirit, whom he, Jesus, richly poured out on us, or God through Jesus, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the gospel of eternal life. This statement is trustworthy. You can count on it. And concerning these things, I want you to speak with the utmost confidence so that those who have believed God, here's the effect, will be careful to engage in good deeds. What happens when God's word gets a hold of our lives? It moves us to action that glorifies God. These things are good and beneficial for all people, not just the church, not just our families. It's beneficial for our culture that we would be God's mark in this world. So let's take a look at our breakdown, our text this morning. We start with the fact that our lifestyle is our testimony and our testimony matters. Verses 1 to 8. Verse 8. I want us to shoot. Our target is verse 8. And then we're going to, verses 1 through 7, get us there. What's verse 8 say? Concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently. Why? So that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. This whole book deals with the reason why this is so important. And so let me give us a little bit of background on this. Chapter 1, verse 9. So that, here's the reason why so that he will be able to both exhort in sound doctrine and refute those who contradict it. Verse 11 of chapter 1, to protect our churches from those who are upsetting entire families. Chapter 2, verse 3, for impact, that the older women would influence and encourage the younger women to be more like Jesus in their behavior. Verse 5, so that the word of God will not be dishonored. The word there is blasphemed or speaking evil of verse 8 that the opponents of the gospel will be put to shame having no leg to stand on and having nothing bad to say about us that when they say the church is full of hypocrites it's not true just look at the church verse 10 so that the people of God in the workforce will adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect Give the world a portrait of what life in Christ is all about. That's the purpose of the truth. And continuing that vein, we have chapter 3, verses 1 to 8. So let's look at the mandate. The mandate is this. 
maintain a godly witness. Doesn't say be perfect, but we want to maintain a witness that reflects the fact that Jesus Christ is the Lord of our lives and our lives surely show it. Stand out with the marks of God in all aspects of life. Live a G-rated life, God-rated life, in an X-rated world. Here's how. Give people a picture of what it means to be principled. That's what he says. Be subject to rulers. Be obedient. Now, I want us to understand the significance of these terms to those to whom Paul was writing or Titus was ministering to. That was the direct opposite of what Cretans were known for. They were known for being rabble-rousers. They were known for being uh, disloyal, kind of beat to their own drum. And Paul is saying, no, no, be subject, be good citizens, represent Christ well, not your own interests. And don't miss the point. Here's what he's saying. Give the secular world the contrast of heaven without being condescending, without being condemning, and without being combative. That's what he's getting at. And I find it's best to avoid extremes when we, can, can, we look at passages such as this and let Scripture interpret Scripture to give us the most accurate biblical perspective. Because we could read this and say, whatever your government tells you to do, do it. And in so doing, honor God. That's what it says, right? Be subject, be obedient. Well, let's take a look at what the Scripture says about this. As we process what the Holy Spirit is saying through Paul, we need to keep the people of the Old Testament in mind. Consider Moses, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Esther, Mordecai, and how they lived righteous lives in a culture that was ungodly and at times anti-God. So how do we be subject to rulers and honor the Lord in a culture that is anti-God? Same way they did. And that's what we're going to apply, and that's exactly what Paul is getting at here. So I think keeping their experiences in mind will help us stay true to our convictions in the ever-increasing godless culture and anti-God world we find ourselves in today and help us understand what it means to be the best of citizens, which is God's calling in our lives and the cultures that he's placed us. When pressed by those in authority to violate the convictions that set us apart as God's people. Here's the tension. Let me remind us some of the lessons our Old Testament heroes teach us in this regard. Number one, being a good citizen doesn't mean watering down godly convictions that set us apart as God's. Nowhere in the scriptures do we find any affirmation to compromise Christian character to keep the peace with the world. Going along to get along. Compromising God's way of doing things for the world's way of doing things. No. To the contrary. Contrary, excuse me. We see the example after example where the people of God resolve themselves that no matter the cost, they're not going to let up on God's word. What did Moses do with Pharaoh? Let my people go. No. I'm not giving up. God said, let my people go. No, I'm not letting up. I'm going to be true to God's word, not your word. So for God's sake and for your sake and for your people's sake and for our people's sake, let God's people go. What did Moses do? He stayed true to the word of God, unmoved by the words of the king. They weren't going to divide themselves, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they wouldn't defile themselves. The Bible says they resolve within themselves that they wouldn't defile themselves with the king's choice food. They wouldn't bow down to the pressure of bowing down to the image of the king. It says, you say to worship this false god? We can't do it. With all due respect, we're, we're going to be the best we can be for God's glory and the kingdom that God has placed us under your rule. But we're not going to violate God's word to honor you. We can't do it, and we won't do it. So if that means costing us our lives, so be it. Put us in the fire. For Esther, 
it didn't refrain her from entering the presence of the king uninvited. You see, being a good citizen doesn't mean watering down godly convictions. We need to live out our convictions in an ungodly world. And there's going to be a tension therein. Secondly, being a good citizen doesn't mean letting up on spiritual disciplines, regardless of the pressure to give them up. Taking prayer out of school. Separation of church and state in our world. Daniel defiled the king's order and continued to pray every morning facing Jerusalem. And I want us to understand what Paul is getting at. Daniel's obedience wasn't an in-your-face disobedience to the king. It was an unwavering commitment to keep the communication line with God open always. And as a matter of utmost importance, no matter the cost, I'm going to spend time with my father, with God. And what was the result? The lion's den. He wasn't going to waver on the spiritual disciplines that caused him to stand out as God's man and be God's instrument in a world so desperate need of godliness. You see, our obligation as citizens never trumps our devotion as fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We can't give up what sets us apart as God's children in this world. There's one voice. We can never afford to proceed without hearing, and that is the Lord's. And if you're taking notes, write that down. That there, there's one voice we cannot afford to proceed without hearing. Be still and know that I'm God. In all the noise, stop. Wait on the Lord. Meditate on his word. If you don't know what God is saying, wait. Listen. Read. Continue. In his time, his word will unfold before you. That's what he says in Titus chapter 1. You see, this uncomfortable tension with those in authority doesn't negate God's presence or God's calling. We learn from our Old Testament protégés that sometimes confrontations that we find ourselves in, at no choice of our own, are really God-ordained. That, what did Esther say? God prepared them, or her, for such a time as this. And so that's what we have in our text. And here's the all-important takeaway that I want us to to balance in our application of this passage. God has placed us where we are with what we have and the circumstances we are in to glorify God. That's the fact. And so whatever situation we find ourselves in, our task and our obligation is to glorify God in it. That's how we subject ourselves and are obedient in this world. Give the world the best picture of Jesus as the psalmist aptly states, not unto us, not unto us, but to your name, O Lord, be the glory. So with this in mind, Paul continues to give us a New Testament charge found in this. As much as possible, as much as it depends on us. So here's what he's saying in subject yourselves to the rulers or the magistrates or those in authority. As much as it depends on us, Be at peace with all men. That's how we have a godly witness in an ungodly world. Submit yourselves to those in charge. This word submit, it's the same, we're talking about wives submitting to their husbands. That we would submit ourselves to our church leaders. It means to empower others to carry out their God-given responsibilities. It doesn't mean do what they say. It means help them carry out their God-ordained function. Sometimes they need to be rebuked. They need to be corrected to line up with God's way of doing things. And God puts you there to help them do that in a non-combative way. Lead from the second seat. When I was an associate pastor, my job wasn't to sit there and just do whatever the senior pastor said to do. My job was to help him carry out his God-given responsibility. So if I saw a need, I would bring it up to him. Here's what's happening. Here's what I think we should do. What do you think? But I felt an obligation, a call from God to resource him with everything I had to make the wisest choice. Be subject to their, resource them with everything they need to make the most wise choices in this world. Don't just go along with everything they say. The point Godliness works regardless of surrounding circumstances. 
So be godly and be a godly influence on others, removing all excuses we might feel because of the corruptness of those in charge. I hope we get that. What Paul is saying here, in light of all the corruption in the world, it doesn't excuse us from being godly in that world. There's no excuse. We may say, you know what? They're so far gone. Give them what they deserve, God. Hail, fire, and brimstone. It's, no. He says, no, in that world, you stand up and be a man of God. You stand up and be a woman of God. You stand up for family values, for biblical values. You stand up for what I declare to be right and true. Listen, any assault on truth is an assault on Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by Him. He is the embodiment of truth. And any attack on the truth has its roots in hell. Where do all lies come from? The Father of lies in hell. And the effects of those lies are working its way all throughout our world. And the answer is always God's truth. And we are to be a testimony of God's standards, of God's truth, with God's grace and God's heart. So, look for areas to agree. The term to obey literally means properly aligned with. That's what we see in all of our Old Testament and New Testament examples. Giving those in charge the proper place of authority they deserve within God's order of leadership. It's given the world what we give one another in the church. And, and this is important. I think this is, this is the emphasis that Paul is making. In essentials, unity. So with those in authority in our world, look for areas to agree. Don't only look for areas where we disagree. Okay, hopefully, that's convicting to some of us. Because I think some of us only look at where we disagree. So Paul's saying, emphasize what you agree on. Think of the people that you dislike the most in positions of power. Now, stop and think about what you agree on with them. Ain't nothing I agree on with them. That's not true. We're not looking hard enough. We need to take this to heart. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. There are some things that don't matter as much as we make them matter. So, grant grace. It's okay to disagree. But in all things, whether we agree or disagree, whether we stand against them or stand with them, all things are to be done with charity or love. That's at the heart of what Paul is getting at in our passage. Now let's look at the motivation. How do we carry this out? The purpose behind these commands is fleshing out the gospel. Three things here. Number one, so that the people of God, so that those you're serving, that those you're working with, will be ready for every good work. It literally reads, ready to meet the need of the moment. Ready because all the preparations, I'm not so much learning things I need in order to be God's representation in this world. I've, I've got what I need to be God's representation in this world. That we are mature as believers. That as we grow up in the Lord, we're resource to make his mark in this world and influence this, this world to, to the Lord. Secondly, remove the world's excuses so that no one is able to speak evil of or blaspheme God on account of you. In other words, live in such a way that God's control of our lives is evident to the world around us. Like Mary and John the Baptist, our daily prayer ought to be, Lord, be it to me according to your word. And you must increase and I must decrease. But may there be more of an effect of you in my life that is seen by others than anything else in this world. That is our privilege, and I would say that is the high calling of every person who bears the name of Jesus Christ and the benefactor of God's incredible goodness. And it's no coincidence. Where does Paul go immediately following that? And to the, the goodness of the gospel. Such were some of you. But when the kindness and the love of our God appeared, we'll get into that later. Here's the point. We are to be so impacted by the goodness, love, grace, power, purity, and glory of God that the world gets a taste of each of these through us. That's Paul's message to the church. At that time, and it's his message to the church today, here it is. Retain the gospel's attractiveness. 
right? He gives us three ways to do this. By being acceptable or peaceable, excuse me. That word means by being uncontentious. Somebody who avoids fight, fighting by being, bringing grace to hot topics. By bringing res, real solutions to difficult problems. By putting water on the fire of contentious moments and always refraining from adding fuel to the fire. And that's how we make God's mark in this world. By being gentle, he says. That means reasonable. By listening, considering the viewpoints, and being forbearing. It's by answering the invitation of our Lord. He says, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. What does he say? For I am meek, I am lowly, I am gentle. And the same way I am, we are to be to the world. Maintain the attractiveness of the gospel. By showing all humility, or humility to all people, Again, modeling the way of Christ. We'll attract more people with honey than vinegar. By leaving a taste of God's goodness instead of man's fallenness in their mouth. That's our task as believers. And that's what Paul is getting at in our text. Well, verse 3 reminds us of the arduous nature, the difficulty of this task. Okay? It's a lot easier said than done. Because what do people in the world want to do? They want to make Christians stumble to excuse themselves to live the life they want to live. So if, if I make you look bad, then I don't feel so bad. If I'm hurt, I'm going to hurt you because I want you to feel what I feel. And so we're placed in this world, and we're not to be hurt people hurting people. God put us here to be healed people healing people of their hurts. So the challenge is clear. Here's the challenge. Bear the winsomeness of Christ. Hallelujah, we love that. To those in opposition to him, oh, Lord, help me. Okay, B, bear the winces of the Christ to people who don't want Christ. Here's the reality of the situation. We're called to preach the message people don't want to hear. So what do we do? We continue to preach the message people don't want to hear. We're called to live a life people don't want to be bothered with. So what do we do? We live a life people don't want to be bothered with, and we bother them with it in a good way. We're to present a choice they don't want to consider. So that's the reality of the situation, and Paul knows that. So let's look at the demands of the situation. Three things here. Number one, be understanding. Oh, this is so good. We've been in their shoes. Verse 3, right? What's it say up there? Is it up there? No, it's not. Okay. It says, such were some of you. It's okay. We've been in their shoes. We all know what it's like. To live life estranged from God. Given over to our sinful desires and the emptiness that kind of lifestyle breeds. We know where, we've been where they are. So don't act like we we weren't. Christians need to be the most humble, the most gracious people. Because we've been where everybody else is outside of Christ. Number two, have realistic expectations. And here's, I think, a very profound truth. Christians, believers, expect sinners to act like believers. No. Expect sinners to act like what? Sinners. So it's on your expectations. Why do you expect somebody who doesn't know Jesus to act like Jesus? That's one expectation. You know, the opposite of that expectation is true. Somebody who knows Jesus, you better start acting like Jesus. Because you, you can't be in right relationship with it if we're not. We can't be comfortable if Jesus isn't winning out in our lives. The Holy Spirit's going to continue working on us, bringing us into submission. Here's a profound statement. People that don't know Christ don't know Christ. They're not empowered. Understand what that means. They're not empowered by Christ and have no capacity to glorify Christ. That's what that means. So what's the answer? They need Jesus. And we need to be the package that God uses to bring them Jesus. That they see in us the attractiveness, the goodness of the glory of God. Hey, man, I've been where you are. It's no place to be. God's transformed my life. He's still in the process of purging me. And he wants to purge you as well. God's way is not only the right way. It's the best way. It's the best way to live. Surrender to him. 
Thirdly, recognize the true nature of the battle we rage or wage. We war not against flesh and blood. I want to ask this question. Why do people act the way they do? Why is there so much animosity in our world and hate? Why can't we just all get along? The question's been raised. What's the answer to that? It's in our passage. Because people are deceived. That's why. You were like them. You too were deceived. You too bought into the lies of the enemy. These are all nothing more than the fruit of the influence of the devil in this world, of believing lies. What did Jesus say? If you know the truth, if you continue my word, my word continues in you, you'll know the truth. What's the truth going to do? It's going to set you free in all these areas. And he says, here's the tragic reality. You think you're in alignment with the truth, but you're not. You're of your father, the devil, who's the father of lies. And that's why all these things are spewing out of our hearts and lives. So, as the world battles, and I want us to understand what's taking place here. As the world battles physically, psychologically, socially for positions of power and influence, we're not to engage in the same manner of warfare. We're to battle spiritually. We're to pray for wisdom. We're to pray for courage. We're to pray for strength. We're to pray for God's will to be done and pray for all men to be saved as a result. And folks, that is a heavy tension and cross to bear. One that we cannot bear on our own. We need Jesus every step of the way. You know, think of police officers. I've been told that pastors are a lot like police officers. Police officers are physically holding evil in our world at bay. Pastors spiritually are holding evil at bay. We're, 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 we're at war with evil in this world. And it's not just physical. There's a spiritual dimension. There's a psych- psychological dimension. And we need to understand God's truth so that we can do it effectively for the glory of God. So that takes us right on to the next point and the rest of this passage, the bulk of this passage deals with. That is the hope of the gospel. Here's the hope. Here's the situation. Here's the challenge. Here's the answer. Praise the Lord. The only power available to produce the kind of changes God both desires and demands that it's real, the gospel. It's able to overcome. We are able to overcome evil with good through the demands or through the power of the gospel. And it's available to all who call upon the Lord. We just looked at that in verses 11 to 15 of chapter 2. You can read that on your own. I'm not going to take time to do that. But let's take, we, Paul gives us six reminders about the nature and effects of the gospel in the life of the church when applied properly. Number one, God's kindness leads to repentance. Verse four, but, here's the answer, but when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind came, oh, it changed everything. If it changes for us, it'll change it for others as well. That's the same process. God has initiated everybody's first step back to God in that while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us, and we champion that message and that truth. Number two, God's kindness is expressed in His love. Verse four. The value he has set for all lives is the life of his son. And I, I want to pause right there. The value he has set for all our lives, the lives of everybody in this world, is his son. How much does God love every single person in this world? Enough to give his son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Don't forget, he so loved the world, Penta, all of it. The word here for love isn't agape. It's philanthropos. It's a love that has our best interest in mind. That's what Paul is saying. In other words, Jesus is the best thing for every person in the world. That's what he's saying. And experiencing his love personally and the provision he provides is the best thing that could happen to any and all of our lives. He gave his only begotten son that we may never lose sight of the value God has placed on the lives of all humanity. So let's just apply this appropriately because then we get little kudo effects. Oh, thank you, Lord. That's so good. But I want us to think about what, in the context of what this is given. 
realistically speaking, the person causing us the most harm and grief. All the fuzzy feelings all went away. (laughs) Is someone Jesus died for and rose again to save. That's what Paul is getting at. See them as such. They're not your enemy. They're your mission field. Before we all get out of shape, we need to remember, we were in their same shoes when Jesus died and rose again to save us. Thank you, Lord. All right. Thirdly, the moment we accept what Jesus provided for us, we are saved. That's the beauty of the gospel. He saved us. We are saved. And he reminds us that our salvation is not based on our performance. It's not based on our efforts to clean things up. It's not based on us doing the right things. Not on deeds, uh, uh, basis of deeds which we did in righteousness, but in accordance with his mercy, uh, through his act of forgiveness. The fact that the chastisement necessary for our well-being fell upon him, and by his stripes, we are made well. We are healed. We're complete. We're in right standing with God. Folks, every single person here that has accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we are in right standing with God. We are declared justice, ju- or justified by his grace. Quit trying to fight for his affection. Enjoy his affection. Live out his affection and share his affection with a world in desperate need of a loving Savior. He says, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, every believer, what it means to be saved is to be born again. That means I'm alive to God. Constantly being conformed into the image of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit keeps hounding me to be more like Jesus. That's why they say the most sad person in the world, the most frustrated person in the world is a Christian who's compromising that I get to sin but not enjoy it because the Holy Spirit won't let me. Well, it used to be so fun. Ugh, I got sick in my stomach on the inside. Why? Because the Holy Spirit's there, and I violated the very presence of God, and he convicts me. That's wrong. It's not good for me. And so I want to line up with what God has, God's way of doing things, God's life. That's that renewing That renewing is an ongoing process. We're constantly being made more like Jesus in our world. Fourthly, we can be confident in our standing with God. Why? Because we're as clean as we'll ever be through His forgiveness, being justified by His grace. As believers, let's stop beating ourselves up for the mistakes we've made, for the sins we've made. Every sin has been taken care of on the cross. Every sin, past, present, and future, is nailed to the cross. Why? So that we are freed. We have no condemnation. I can be everything God's called me to be. Thank you, Lord. It's not based on what I do. It's based on what you're doing through me. And now I'm throwing myself all in in that process. Fifthly, we can be confident of our future. Hallelujah. Why can we continue to stand and and, and take this barrage from the world? Because we know where we're going. He says we would be, we, that, that we would be heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We are joint heirs with Jesus. And we will be forever with him. Hallelujah. Yesterday, I got a call from my brother and his, his girlfriend's dad. They were going to pull the plug. He, I went and saw him before we came out to here to California. And he was in a coma. He had a chance to pray with him. And with EJ passing a little more than a week ago, a week ago, there's the, there's that the, the weight and the hurt of people that you love so dearly being taken so so early in their lives. EJ's just two years older than I am. I remember talking to him a week ago Monday, and he says, "I was so glad to see everybody come and see me. A bunch of people from the church and others." Saw him, and he says, I was, I was infused with power. I, 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 I had energy I haven't had for a long time, seeing everybody. He goes, but today I'm suffering for I, I, I'm weaker than I normally am. I asked him, EJ, now I want to see you, man. I'm going to be out there on the 22nd. Do I need to come earlier than that? He said, dang, man, there's a lot of people on hospice that I'm doing a lot better than they are. You're fine. Come on the 22nd. He passed away that week. He said, you know what? 
he talked to his son, his son, his son dad, he asked him, dad, what's, what's, what's the, what's our, our recovery plan here? He said, he looked at his son, he said, son, there is no recovery plan. I'm dying. And the reality of it is that that's not the end. Jesus says, when we die, we never die. We, 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 we enter life eternal. What did he talk to the disciples? He says he's leaving in John chapter 14. He's moving. He's, he says, I'm not going to be here any longer. And it's, it's more you're, for your betterment that I'm gone because you're all going to get the Holy Spirit. And he's going to guide you. He's going to be for you what I've been. But he'll, he's with you 24-7. And they're like, no, 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 we'll take you. <laughs> we, we don't understand that yet. And Jesus says, don't let your hearts be troubled. That's our action. You don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God. You believe also in me. Take me at my word. Here's the comfort. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Okay? When you go, you're going to come with me for eternity in heaven. Hallelujah. That's the promise. That's what we're living for. Do we believe what we're teaching? Do we believe what God says? Well, it'll show in our, our, our lives. And look at what Jesus said to him. He says, if it were not so, I would have told you. Do you believe him? Now look at the very next thing he says. But I go. You believe me. I go to prepare a place for you that where I am, there you will be also. That's God's promise to every single believer. Death is not the end. We are going to be with him forever. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. That's the blessed hope and assurance of the church. And that's what the gospel brings every believer. And that's what separates Christianity from every other religion. So, he says, don't fall asleep at the wheel. Verse 8. This statement is trustworthy. The things I've told you. And concerning these things, I want you to speak confidently. Man, hold on. What's the application there? We would be wise to use our influence as parents, as siblings, as aunts and uncles, friends, co-workers and neighbors to go all in on the truth of the gospel, living it, sharing it, teach them, model them. This is a trustworthy statement. What is he saying? Make them the, the dominating thought of your life and practice of your life. Remind those we love and care about that the power of the gospel translates into transformed lives. He says these things are trustworthy. What's going to happen as they work its way through our lives and our thinking? That those who, so that those who believe in God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and beneficial for all people. May we never lose sight of our mission statement as a church. What has God put us here to be? Grow fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. That's it. It's not enough to have babies. Sometimes we think the church is to get people to get saved. Raise a hand. Listen, it's one thing to have babies. It's another thing to raise babies. And the church is called to raise babies into fully mature men and women of God who understand the word of God, people of principle and faith. How do we gauge our success? We will be known by our fruit. That's what he's saying here. The impact the gospel has on our daily lives. The impact the gospel has on all aspects of our lives. That's what the people of Titus' day needed to hear, and I believe that's what we need to hear today as well. So I close with three application points. Number one, the gospel must be learned. This is a trustworthy statement. Understand it. Take it to heart. So, take advantage of every opportunity to better understand it. Young men, don't settle for somebody else explaining the gospel for you. Learn it yourself. When I was a 18-year-old, 19-year-old, I remember I was a youth pastor at 19 years old. I had a lot of passion. I didn't have a lot of knowledge of the truth. And so I preached with a lot of passion. I look back now and said, what did I say? <laughs> I, I just said it really, really well. But, but grow. And I began to grapple with questions and, and Lord, I want to learn these things so that I can better communicate them and pass them on to the next generation. 
We live in a world of the church that has doctrine deficit disorder. We don't know what we believe. God forgive us. And God help us. To the next generation, let's learn what God's word says. Take it to heart and live it and share it with the world that desperately needs it. Learn the gospel. It's, no, it's worth noting, verses 4 to 7 is written hymnically or poetically so that people could sing it. And in singing it, they would understand the gospel. They'd be able to explain it more simply to those they were sharing the truth with. Learn the gospel. Secondly, the gospel must be applied. That's where respect comes in. So take advantage of every opportunity to do good. Be eager to do good. Live as if God is is watching, eagerly awaiting to hear him. In all that we've done, to the least of these, his brethren, he says, in as much as you've done to the least of these, you've done it to me. Eager to hear what words? Well done, my good and faithful servant. When it comes and I stand before the Lord, you know the words I want to hear? Well done, my good and faithful servant. My love language, words of affirmation. I love to just tell you how much I appreciate you and love you. And when you do that for me, oh, I feel so good. I feel so loved. And my prayer when I go to heaven and see Jesus and bend a knee before him, I long to hear the words, you encouraged my people. You encouraged as many as you knew to know me to love me and to serve me. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to be faithful to what God has put for me. As much as it depends upon me, as much as possible, do good. Help others see the wonders, the glory, the grace, and the goodness of God. How are they going to see it? Through us, his hands and feet. Thirdly, the gospel must be shared. So take advantage of every opportunity to pass it on. I've heard the phrase... You know, I'm on my way to heaven, and I'm going to bring as many people as long as with me as possible. That's, our, that's, that's it. I'm not going alone. Intentionally, give others the opportunity to receive or reject. We don't make Christians. God does. Amen? There, there's nothing I can do to save somebody. Jesus has already done it. They just have to accept it or reject it. What people do with the gospel is between them and God, accepting or rejecting it. But people having the opportunity to hear the gospel is between us and God, and we'll give an account. So live to give as many people as as possible the opportunity to believe or reject the gospel and leave it in God's hands. Be faithful at what he's put before us. And that reminds us of what it means to be a Christian. This to me is the DNA of the church. The church is the people of God. And so in closing, our takeaway today, because God has welcomed us into his family. Can we pause for a moment? Thank you, Lord. What a privileged position. You know, every single Sunday to me is a date with God. And I think, I think of the, in, in Luke, there were people were on the outside of town. They had, uh, what, what did they have? They were where you're falling off. You're, you're falling off. Leprosy. <laughs> Sorry for the graphic. <laughs> They're outside, right? They're unclean, and you, they can't be around anybody. And, and Jesus goes, and there's ten of them, and, and he heals them. And he tells them, go to the temple and, and, and give gratitude for what, what God's doing, God done your, for your life. And, and they went and they went their own way. Like, we're healed. Hallelujah. God's so good. And, and one out of ten came back. And told Jesus, thank you. Every Sunday to me, I feel obligated in a good way. I get a chance to sit down and say, God, thank you. Mm, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. You welcomed me into your family. I don't deserve it. And I want to share that with as many people as possible. God has welcomed us into his family through faith in Jesus Christ. And in order, as a member of God's family, in order to fulfill our God-given purpose as fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ, here's what possesses us, God, as believers. 
And whatever we do, whatever position we find ourselves in, we will express God's grace in a broken world. We will share his love, reflect his hope, extend his peace, and be a voice of truth in a world of chaos. And because God is with us everywhere we go, that's the gospel, right? Emmanuel, God with us. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. We can live with that confidence. And because God is with us everywhere we go, we'll expect God to do great things at all times as we step out in obedience to his call. When God says do something, I'm going to do it. And God, I trust you to do with that what you will. We will do everything. We will live for the fame and glory of Almighty God. That's why he's put us here. Amen? Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, mm, 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 love you so much. God, thank you for the privilege of sharing your word. And, and I pray now that, Holy Spirit, we give you your rightful place. We understand that this is your word. And, and you, you make the most sense of it to us and how it plays out practically in our daily living. And so we give you that rightful place and, and ask you now to, number one, we can't do for others what we had never experienced ourselves. So we ask that you would have your way in us. Where there's been hurt, will you provide healing? Would you, as the God of all comfort, overwhelm us with your grace and your mercy? Would you saturate us, uh, really fill us to overflowing with your love? And out of that, extend it to others to be your voice, to carry out your, 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 your heart and your plan and to be an extension of your grace in a world that's in desperate need of a Savior. So, Lord, we see this opposing worldviews at a standstill, and there's this great warfare taking place in our world. Remind us, Lord, it's not a physical battle that we are engaged in, but a spiritual one. And so I pray for us, your church, that you'd give us wisdom, you'd give us understanding, you'd give us courage to say the right things at the right times in the right way, in the right spirit, with, with the right character, that you'd have your way in us so that, you, so that you can have your way through us. We place ourselves in the care of your hands and ask you to be glorified in the details of our daily living. That's our prayer. Granted, we ask in Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, amen, and amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for being here, and may his best always be yours. God bless you.